Let's give it up for Dr. Rhonda Patrick and Dr. Walter Longo. By way of introduction, uh, Rhonda is a PhD in biochemical medicine, uh, a scientist, an educator, a podcaster. Uh, Walter is at uh, USC, uh, running the Longevity Institute there, uh, and really an expert in the fasting mimicking diet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, allow me to give uh, a little context of where I'm coming from on this. So I run the X Prize. I'm chairman of the X Prize. We just launched $141 million incentive competition uh, for teams that can reverse losses of cognitive, immune, and muscle by 20 years. All right. So that's the goal. Can we make you 20 years functionally younger? I've got a $600 million venture fund investing in this area, uh, and something called Fountain Life, which is advanced diagnostics and therapeutics. I fundamentally believe that we can double the human lifespan again. You have to remember, all of you here would be dead 100,000 years ago, right? The average human lifespan was on the early side of 30, maybe late 20s. You'd be pregnant by the time you were 13. By the time you were 26 or 27, your baby was having a baby. And before food was abundant, the last thing that you wanted to do to perpetuate the species was to steal food from their mouths. So you would die. There was never any selective pressures to live longer. But here we are. We've done an amazing job. And the question is, can we extend it even further? And that number you have in your mind of how long you want to live, your mindset is a fundamental part of that, I believe. So, some context there. Uh, Rhonda, let's begin with you. Uh, you have been on an incredible mission of educating people about this. Uh, what do you think are the principal activities right now for optimal health, right, in terms of extending longevity? When you're at dinner, when you're speaking, what's your advice to folks? Well, I think it's important to distinguish lifespan from health span first, right? So health span would be making you more youthful at a time in your life when you would normally be more disabled and unhealthy. And I think that we can improve health span on a global scale. Actually, I think, you know, not necessarily using really cool, fancy biotechnology, although we can do that. Um, I think it's actually just a matter of getting the right information to people. So it's knowledge. And obviously, I don't have to convince people here. I mean, Google's like the leader in organizing the world's knowledge and inventing new tools to help us access it. But still, the reality is um, fundamental health information is not accessible enough. For example, we know that you know, about 80% of the world and 90% of the US population does not get enough omega-3, does not meet the requirements for omega-3 fatty acids. And we know now that having a low omega-3 index, so this is the marker of your omega-3 levels in your blood cells, is like smoking. So let me repeat that, okay? A low omega-3 levels, like your, your, your index of omega-3, um, smokers that have a high level of omega-3 have the same life expectancy as non-smokers with a low omega-3. I mean, beautifully overlaid on the graph, the same mortality risk. So, I mean, that's something that everyone knows is bad, smoking, but nobody is walking around knowing what their omega-3 levels are and knowing if they're getting enough omega-3. And it's as simple as getting a test done and, and measuring that and then either you know, adding some fish to your diet or supplementing um, with supplements as well. So people with a high omega-3 index have a five-year lifespan extension compared to people with a low omega-3 index. So high being 8% and low being 4%. Well, the average omega-3 index in the US is 5%. So we can improve there, and it's really not that, it's a very practical solution, right? Choose carefully at lunch today, guys. Um, I, the other one would be vitamin D. So vitamin D is something that we make from UVB radiation from the sun. We make it in our skin. It's very important. It gets converted into a steroid hormone, steroid hormone like estrogen, testosterone, and yet 70% of the US population has insufficient vitamin D levels. That's a lot of people. 30% of those people have deficient levels where they're severely deficient. 
Why is that? Well, because we're spending more time indoors, we wear sunscreen, um, we have people that have you know, natural sunscreen, right? Melanin is a natural sunscreen in our skin. So the, the, the information is not out there that we need to get our vitamin D levels checked, and then we need to make a lifestyle change accordingly. In this case, it would be easy. You take a, a supplement. 2,000 to 4,000 IUs a day is pretty much enough to get your vitamin D levels to sufficient level. But why should you care? So a steroid hormone, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. It actually gets into the nucleus of your cell. It interacts with DNA. It recognizes a very specific sequence of DNA called a vitamin D response element. It's present in like 5% of the protein encoding in the human genome. So it's regulating a lot of our genes. It's turning them on and activating them, turning them off, deactivating them. Important genes, ones involved in longevity. So we, we know from ran, um, Mendelian randomized controlled trials, so these are studies that we can do in humans where we use genetics to understand how a risk factor, in this case, low vitamin D, affects an outcome, which would be mortality risk. And so people have genes that don't allow them to convert vitamin D3 into the active steroid hormone very well. And so it's a beautiful way of doing a randomized controlled trial in people for years and years and years, which you're never going to get, and you know, you'll never be able to fund that. Um, and from those studies, we know that people with low vitamin D genetically have a higher all-cause mortality and they have a higher cancer-related mortality. And furthermore, there have been randomized controlled trials done in people that are vitamin D deficient. They're given a vitamin D supplement, 4,000 IUs a day for a few weeks, and they were able to reverse their biological age by almost two years. And we can talk about what biological age is maybe later. But, um, so vitamin D is important for the aging process. 70% of the U.S. population has insufficient levels, and it's an easy solution. So again, people just aren't getting the information. Um, and lastly, I would say the, the, probably the most important thing would be to be physically active and make it a part of your, your personal hygiene routine, like you brush your teeth every morning. It's not something that you add on. So cardiorespiratory fitness is like the best marker, not only of, of your fitness levels, a lot of you know, athletes use that as a marker of their fitness. It's actually probably one of the best markers of longevity, in my opinion. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have come out showing that a high cardiorespiratory fitness, if you're in the elite level, so cardiorespiratory fitness is really just the amount of oxygen that you can take in during physical activity so that you can supply you know, nutrients and oxygen to your, to your muscles, to, you know, to other tissues. So it's really important um, for, for just normal, normal life as well, right? I mean, we're breathing in oxygen every day. So people that have a high cardiorespiratory fitness have about an 80% reduced all-cause mortality compared to people with a low cardiorespiratory fitness. So in other words, at any point in their life, they're 80% less likely to die than the people with a low cardiorespiratory fitness. But the real kicker is, is that the people with the low cardiorespiratory fitness, okay, these were people that were sedentary, so they're not physically active, but they didn't have any identifiable diseases. So they didn't have cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure, et cetera. And yet, they had the same mortality risk or worse than smokers, people with hypertension, people with cardiovascular disease, and people with diabetes. So in other words, being sedentary is a disease. It is something that you need to think about as a disease, and you need to incorporate exercise into your daily routine. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but one of the best ways to improve cardiorespiratory fitness is vigorous intensity exercise. How many folks were in the gym this morning? Raise your hand. Come on. How many were in Carl's boot camp? Yes. So, you know, it really remains the basics. Right now, it's sleep, eight hours, exercise, and diet. Um, Walter, you have uh, made your mark in the universe uh, with the fasting mimicking diet, uh, Prolon, which is a product that I love and I use on a regular basis. What is the fasting mimicking diet? What is, why is, how does fasting connect to longevity? And by the way, we're doing this just before lunch, just for you. Yeah, so, so if we look at 100 years of research on aging, I think that most scientists that do aging research will agree that calorie restriction, so this dietary intervention, is very simple, right? What happens if you start with a normal level of calories and then you reduce it by 25%, right? And so that's been very successful, but it's also, if you look deep in the data, there is, even in mice, right, as many will live longer, if you calorie restrict them, as they will live, they have a neutral effect or a negative effect. So, so it means that it's, it's more complicated than it seems, right? But um, so, so if you think about aging, the question is, 
if you look at a mouse, right, a mouse lives two and a half years, and it gets cancer, say, about one and a half years uh, of age. And people live 80 years, and they get cancer at 40, right? So it's really about a program, right? So the mouse is on a two and a half year program, right? And, and so it ages, and as it ages, it starts developing all kinds of diseases. And people are on an 80 year program, and around 40, they start getting uh, lots of diseases. So the question is, and what I call juventology, how do you move, a, how you move that program from 40 year, like say almost perfect, very healthy lifespan, um, to 60 or 70 years, right? And eventually, like you talked about, even more, right? So, so I think there's three things that, that we like. I mean, and of course, what Rhonda talked about is the fourth, right? the exercise and all that. Um, and so one of them, I call it the longevity diet, right? And the longevity diet is really, I mean, if you look at how people give recommendations about diet, it's a lot of the times it's about epidemiology, right? You only look at the, I mean, a lot of people just look at epidemiology. And we think it's great, right? It's one pillar. But then you have to have the clinical studies, the basic research, the centenarians. How do the centenarians make it to a very long lifespan, right? And also, like another pillar, which is called complex system, right? How does the plane age, right? How does the shuttle age? Um, so, so yes, yeah, so then if you, if you put it all together and you look at common denominator, you come up with something that's probably pescatarian, right? Fish plus vegan, right? And, um, and it's also age-specific, meaning that an 80-year-old, I mean, first of all, two different people should not have the same diet, right? And this is why something very, probably the most important thing that you could do is find the right expert that can follow you, right? Or the right clinic that can follow you, because it's so complicated that people have no idea. Uh, so somebody could have, let's say, the Mediterranean diet, do great, and the person next to them could go through hell because they have celiac disease or, or, or gluten sensitivity, right? So it's extremely complex, and yet we have very little investment in professionals that can follow people through this complexity, right? So pescatarian diet, uh, so longevity diet, fish plus um, uh, vegan, but with a lot of complexity in it, right? So, uh, and you need the pros for that. And then second, time restricted eating, right? So such in Panda and others, and there's a lot of, and a lot of people here probably do 16 hours, and I always say it's a bad idea, right? And why is that a bad idea? Well, most people do 16 hours of fasting per day, so 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of feeding, um, and most people that do that skip breakfast, right? So now, if you look at 30 years of research, mostly epidemiological, but not only epidemiological, because now there's new data, uh, clinical data. Um, people that skip breakfast live shorter with more cardiovascular disease, right? So then Frank Hu and company at, at Harvard, they will argue, well, that's because people that skip breakfast have bad habits, okay? But, but I always say, well, <coughs> you know, maybe they have bad habits, but why, why don't they at least live normal, right? <laughs> if they're doing these 16 hours and it's so powerful, uh, why don't they, that doesn't counterbalance the problem. So then I moved it to 12 hours, right? And tw why is 12 hours? Because first do no harm, right? So, so 12 hours is pretty powerful already. Most Americans eat for 15 hours a day, right? So if you can bring it back to 11 and to 12, that already, we know, makes a big difference in sleep and makes a big, big difference in metabolic health, right? So 12 hours. And I always say, I've never met a doctor or a scientist that says that's bad for you. 12 hours is bad for you, and here's why. Here's the publication that says 12 hours of fasting is bad for you, but lots of bad data on 16 hours. And, and a new study now, indicating it doesn't even matter if you skip breakfast or dinner. If you do 16 hours, you're going to live shorter. Now, it's an abstract that was presented at the American Heart Association. It's not out yet, but, but that's what they're saying. And then the third is what you mentioned, the fasting making diet. So fasting making diet, I mean, it's not really about diet. It's about the ability of the human body to repair itself, right? So I always, and probably when I was on your show and yours, I talked about cutting. You know, if you cut yourself, um, you know, within a couple of weeks, Perfect, right? Because everything is repair, self-repair mechanism. Right? So then the body, does the body have that ability everywhere, in every organ, in every system? I think so, right? I think so. So now we've done a lot of mouse and rat and human data where we look at the pancreas. We damage the pancreas. And the body, you, do, you use the fasting mimicking diet, and you see this Yamanaka factor, this reprogramming being turned on. You see the, the stem cells in the blood, the hematopoietic stem cells start self-renewing. And you see, of course, everybody talks about autophagy, right? But the autophagy is probably only 10% of the whole process that happens. So the body shrinks, and then it starts turning on stem cells, reprogram cells, and then the body, once you refeed, it starts re-expanding, 
And, and in that process, he's able to detect, so, so it's a, I always say, three billion years of R&D, right? So billions of years of developing like, a repair for the skin, for the liver, for the lungs, for the brain. You know, we also see stem cells being turned on in, in the brain. And so, yeah, so then two or three cycles a year of the fasting Mickey diet. So it's a five-day vegan diet that has the job of mimicking fasting. So people struggle. We started with water-only fasting a long time ago at USC doing a cancer trial and realized that nobody wanted to fast, right? Nobody wanted to do water-only fasting. And so the oncologists were not happy, and the, people, the patients were not happy. And so we, we went to the NIH, and then they funded the fasting mimicking diet, right? So this was done for cancer patients first, and then the NIA, the National Institute of Aging, funded the, the version for, for, uh, uh, for everybody else, right? So, yeah, so I think that these three cycles, the FMD, have the job. So we are about to publish on kidney disease, a clinical trial. We're about to publish on hyposmia, like loss of chemosensory function. And the cycles of the FMD are able to bring many patients back from all kinds of different problems, right? So this is why we're very, very excited, not so much about the diet, but what the diet triggers in the human body, these self-repair mechanisms. I want to open up for questions, but let me give a little context on a little bit more extreme on longevity. Uh, there's a concept called longevity escape velocity. I want to share it with you as folks, again, go to the mics if you wish. Um, and this is work that Aubrey de Grey, Ray Kurzweil, George Church, others, Today, science is extending your life for about a quarter to a third of a year for every year that you're alive. There is a moment in time, it's believed, that science is going to extend your life for more than a year for every year that you're alive. And that idea is called longevity escape velocity. The question is, when are we going to see something like longevity escape velocity? Uh, Ray's prediction uh, is by 2030, 2031, George Church, David Sinclair, by the mid-2030s. You know, when you think about it, you know, I spend half my life in longevity, half my, spend my life in AI. It's the convergence of those two, right? We are a collection of 40 trillion cells. Every, every cell is running a, a billion to two billion chemical reactions per second. Why does someone live to 120 and someone's dead at 60? It's not mystery, it's in the data. Right? And our ability to understand that, to begin to model cells, to understand why we age, how do you slow it, stop it, potentially reverse it. Right? Bowhead whales live 200 years old, Greenland sharks live 500 years old, have babies at 200 years, how would you like that? <laughs> why can they, why can't we? It's either a hardware problem or a software problem. And this is the decade that we get the tools to understand that.